Welcome back. This is actually our last video on psychopathology, so don't look for a fourth video. It's that I really didn't find a great cut point on these, so in this video we're going to be talking about pretty much all the other, well not all the other disorders, but a good grouping of other disorders that are fairly common and how they're treated and some of the hypotheses behind them. So seasonal affective disorder is a, um, a mood disorder that's brought on by shorter days of winter. So the prevalence of seasonal affective disorder actually increases with latitude. And it responds, the response rate to light therapy, uh, phototherapy, is 60 to 90%, which is actually really, really good. So the phototherapy is usually administered in the morning um, to suppress melatonin, which, as you'll remember from the sleep chapter, is a hormone whose secretions may be aligned with sleep and help shape our circadian rhythm. So with this, it has to be a pretty specialized, um, really bright light. So bright indoor light is usually less than 500 lux. And the standard dose for phototherapy is 10,000 lux for 30 minutes a day. So it has to be a specialized piece of equipment, but light boxes, usually they're a couple hundred bucks, um, but they're very effective for seasonal affective disorder. There's also some evidence that antidepressants may be helpful for seasonal affective, but if you can, if you're able to handle the light therapy, it's hard to argue against it given the, the high response rate and also, um, there aren't a huge number of side effects with the light therapy. Bipolar disorder is a disorder that's characterized by periods of depression alternating with periods of expansive mood or mania. It's worth noting that the depression in bipolar is um, often a more severe depression than you see with unipolar depression. So rapid cycling within bipolar um, isn't necessarily even all that rapid. We're talking about four or more cycles in one year. So if you go through a cycle, you know, once every couple months, you'd be rapid cycling. Now, the book mentions that cycling can happen in one day. But my caveat on this is um, one has to be sure that it's not better accounted for by borderline personality disorder. The um, the black and white um, positive negative thinking of borderline can often look very similar to bipolar in my experience. So just something to keep in mind if you see some very, very rapid cycling. So um, actually like schizophrenia, individuals with bipolar disorder often have enlarged ventricles and actually individuals with unipolar depression do as well for that matter. Uh, bipolar is often difficult to treat in part because people really enjoy the manic phase. It's a time that, you know, people feel good, they're very productive, very artistic. So it's hard sometimes to convince an individual to be treated because there are benefits to the manic phase. There are certainly costs, but there are also some benefits to that manic phase. Um, so here are some people that are either believed to be, um, to have met criteria for bipolar or have said that they meet criteria for bipolar or have been diagnosed with bipolar. So you can see pretty common for a lot of artists to have this disorder. And again, a lot of artists report that they do their best work when they're in those manic phases where they don't need a lot of sleep and they have that elevated mood. So there's also cyclothymia. Cyclothymia is a milder form of bipolar um, where patients cycle between dysthymia, which is a mild depression, and hypomania, which is in a time of increased energy. So as far as um, treatment, it's really hard to beat lithium. So lithium is a mood stabilizing drug that's used to treat bipolar, and it was actually found by accident when it was used as a placebo drug. We don't know how it works, which always frightens me, but what we do know is that it affects many different parts of the brain, and it also has an effect on the circadian rhythm. It's very effective, um, it's actually as effective as many of the more expensive medications out there, 
But the problem with lithium is it has a very narrow therapeutic index, meaning that the dose that it's effective at is not that far away from the uh, toxic dose. So with this, if you take lithium, you have to get regular blood tests to make sure that you don't have too much lithium in your body. You know, you don't want a toxic level in your body. Also, Depakote, which is a more expensive anticonvulsant medication, is often also used for bipolar, um, in part because it has a wider therapeutic index. So you don't have to do the blood test with the Depakote, but it's also more expensive on the other hand. So anxiety disorders, a lot of people suffer from anxiety disorders. Some, some examples are panic disorder where you have um, panic attacks, you have generalized anxiety disorder, and you can also have phobias, um, snake phobia, spider phobia, just depends on the person. Um, PTSD used to be considered an anxiety disorder. That changed with DSM-5, but um, it shares a lot of the same attributes as many anxiety disorders. So one of the main treatments for anxiety disorders are benzodiazepines, and these are anxiolytic drugs that are used to treat anxiety. So what they do is they bind to GABA receptors and they enhance GABA's inhibitory actions. So they're GABA agonists. Um, what you also are seeing, especially you're seeing more and more, is serotonin agonists um, and also SSRIs are being used to treat anxiety. Um, and the reason for this is that with the benzodiazepines, you have a higher risk of, um, of addiction. So with that, you can use SSRI medications such as Boost Bar to treat the anxiety. The problem is it doesn't it doesn't work as immediately, so you don't take the pill and you immediately feel better. But much like SSRIs do with depression, over time it reduces the level of anxiety. Cognitive behavioral therapy is also an awesome option for anxiety. It's one of the things that we do best. Um, so if you if you or a family member are struggling with anxiety, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a really good um, consideration. So post-traumatic stress disorder is where after a traumatic event, you have unpleasant memories, rep um, repeated flashbacks, and also some deficits such as short-term memory deficits um, as a result of the trauma. Now it's important to note, not everyone who experiences a trauma will develop PTSD. Uh, so there seems to be factors that increase vulnerability. About a third of the variants can be explained by genetics, um, at least in twin studies. Also, pre-trauma nightmares, so if you have nightmares before the trauma, that has been shown to put people at higher risk of developing PTSD later on as well. So individuals with PTSD show smaller right hippocampus um, volumes, which may be part of the reason that we see some memory changes and problems with short-term memory in PTSD. Individuals with PTSD actually also show a reduction in cortisol, which is opposite what you would think. And it's hypothesized that this may be because individuals who have PTSD become more sensitive to the stress hormone. Um, also, one treatment that's being examined, and it's still controversial, I guess is the right word for it, is giving glucosteroids glucose steroids um, right after a trauma has been shown to reduce the negative impact of the memories and make developing PTSD less likely. Obsessive compulsive disorder is marked by recurring repetitive acts. So here you have both obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are the thoughts, compulsions are the actions. So in OCD patients, you may see a routine act become a compulsion, such as washing your hands again and again, and a recurrent thought becoming an obsession. So, you know, I may have an obsession about being clean and, you know, about things being um, infected, and then I need to wash things again and again and again, and that would be the compulsion. 
So OCD actually responds to SSRIs pretty well in most cases, suggesting that serotonin dysfunction in the orbital prefront or orbital frontal or um, the prefrontal cortex may play a role. Also, therapies such as exposure with response prevention are also very effective, but they're challenging for the clients because you're making someone do what it is they're afraid to do. But they're very effective if the client can get through it. OCD is often also comorbid with uh, Tourette syndrome. So that means that they commonly occur together. It's often also comorbid with depression, as you may be able to guess with this serotonin dysfunction. So with Tourette syndrome, um, patients have heightened sensitivity to tactile, auditory, and visual stimuli. Um, it's usually diagnosed pretty early, like ages six to seven, and children may also be more likely to exhibit ADHD or um, OCD. So one of the things that can actually be helpful for this one of the treatments is punishing tics. Um, so swearing tics come to mind um, where someone, you know, the tic is that they have to say a, uh, a verbal swear word. You can actually punish that and decrease the behavior. So it responds to behavioral um, interventions. So with this, I have a very brief video from Barter King's two minutes um, of Antonio talking about his Tourette syndrome that I think is worth watching. seven years old I was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome and that means sometimes I make sudden noises or motions so I'm up on diesel I'm riding them and the Tourette kicks in yeah ho ho Woo! I had ticks ever since I was two years old I was making funny faces and hitting myself and making funny noises and my parents didn't understand so by the time I was seven they thought something was really wrong with me so they took me to a doctor and and not a lot of people really knew about Tourette back then so it was just you know only a few hundred thousand people had it so they didn't have a whole lot of research on it so but when I was seven I went to the, my parents took me to the doctors and they said that I had Tourette syndrome and um, they tried to put me on medication several times but I'll tell you what the medication had so many side effects and nobody knew what medication worked at the time there wasn't a lot of research on Tourette syndrome so now they're doing a lot more research and a lot more work on it so you know they have a lot more knowledge about Tourette syndrome nowadays how about this <laughs> look at that well, when Antonio and I are bartering together, his Tourette's doesn't play a huge factor, but I have a little fun with Antonio every once in a while, and uh, I cause him a little bit of grief, but it's all in good fun, and uh, I actually think it helps lighten the mood, and it helps us make trades. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste for Tourette's. So how do you treat this? Well, um... The current hypothesis is that the disorder is due to an excess of dopamine. So dopamine D2 receptors are denser in the caudate nucleus of um, a Tourette sufferer than is seen in a non-Tourette sufferer in twin studies. There are also differences in the dopaminergic system, especially in the basal ganglia. So with this, um, th there's been a fair amount of research now, and the medications that have the most empirical support are antipsychotic medications. So medications such as um, Haldol, which is also Haloperidol, same thing, um, which is a dopamine antagonist, can actually help with Tourette's because it helps um, reel in that overactive dopamine system. Psychosurgery. So this is where we actually use brain lesions to modify severe psychiatric disorders. This used to be done a ton with lobotomies, where um, you would dissect parts of the frontal or disconnect parts of the frontal lobe from the rest of the brain, but it had significant, significant side effects. Um, now there are more localized lesions that have 
been proven to be more effective. Though, as we'll talk about in the next slide, there there is some debate on how effective these really are. So you can have a singular otomi, which is a um, a lesion of the cingulate cortex, and this can be used to treat anxiety, depression, and OCD. Um, you also have a capsulotomy, which is lesions of the internal capsule um, to treat anxiety disorders. And then, of course, we talked about deep brain stimulation, where you can implant electrodes um, in order to treat disorders such as depression, um, sometimes it's used in Parkinson's. So, there, there are some small case studies showing these treatments to be effective. The problem is that we don't have case controlled studies. Again, because you don't want to drill a hole in someone's head and have them be a control. So with this, we don't know that the effects that we're seeing are anything more than just the placebo effect. So it's important to keep that in mind with these treatments. So now moving over to um, prions. So prions are abnormally folded um, endogenous proteins that lead to brain degeneration. So they're essentially a, this all relates to mad cow disease you'll see. There's actually a disease related to it in sheep um, called strapey because the sheep will just keep straping themselves. Um, those that have this. And it's a fatal disease in sheep that's caused by these prions. So bovine spongiform encephalopath encephalopathy, sorry about that, aka mad cow disease, is a disease that's caused by these prions. So again, prions are abnormally folded proteins and they lead to brain degeneration. Um, it's called spongiform because this brain actually at the end looks like a sponge. There are all these holes um, in, the, in the brain. So mad cow disease is caused by ingesting these abnormally folded prion proteins and this then affects the way that prion proteins um, fold in the brain leading to brain degeneration. And the end result is um, dementia and death. So Crutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the human form of it. And again, it causes a dementia, uh, sleep disorders, and schizophrenia-like symptoms, and eventually it leads to death.